The servants were running about, knocked off their feet. The master had warned them too late that there would be a banquet at his cottage tonight. In fact, William himself had not planned that this year things would not go according to plan. Every time they celebrated his birthday, as it was supposed to be in his favorite restaurant. But since this year was his anniversary, at least that's what his younger brother thought. The 40th anniversary celebration was to be held in two stages. The first at the cottage was the so-called stag party. William decided to gather all his friends and just get drunk. And a week later, the same group, but with wives, to sit at a rich table. The landlord arrived early. He kept pulling things out of his car. It was already about four o'clock, and by eight o'clock all the preparations had to be finished. The cook and two assistants and a couple of other people were running around the two-story cottage with William, trying to organize everything so that the stag party would be a big success. William. A girl in an apron ran up to the man. The apron was so big that she drowned in it and resembled a butcher. Leave the salmon in larger pieces or thinly sliced. Polly sent the cook, who was now completely absorbed in the preparation of appetizers, since the host explicitly stated that they would drink a lot today. They would need the same amount of food. Polly, I don't care. Tell Mike to cook everything to his liking. William replied quickly. We'll set up the tables with Peter. William drank very rarely, four times a year on his birthday, on his wife's birthday, and on the anniversaries of his parents' deaths. As for his younger brother, Tim, he indiscreetly indulged in all the pleasures of life and often disappeared on his birthday. So that didn't count. Why exactly this year William had agreed to such a global binge? There were several reasons. The man took over the company after the death of his father and in the last three years, you could say, at work overnight. William set himself the goal of reorganizing and reaching the next level. But it wasn't easy. He felt like he had given up 10 years of his life to see it through. And finally, this year, it was finished. The tension was so intense that William just wanted to forget for a while and get some rest. Tim was part owner of the company, but he only had 30% of his father's estate. That was his wish. The younger son never did anything at all, never helped his father, and generally always lived his own life. When Tim found out about it, he made constant scandals for three months. But after his father warned him that he would deprive him of everything, the man calmed down. In addition, he immediately declared that his foot would not be in the office, that all the work will be handled by William. But have a conscience, his father told him then. Why do you think you're so special? Why does William have to work and you don't? The younger son tried to argue with him, but he couldn't come up with a coherent argument. Anyway, Tim was a big fan of company and big gatherings. Since he had to interfere in the company's affairs and help his older brother this year, he wanted to show his merits to everyone. Tim always liked to brag. It was one of his favorite things to do when he was around people. So he decided to talk his brother into a bachelor party, because there he could tell everyone that his older brother couldn't have done it without him. He is the one who made this, you could say, a coup in their business. Lily, William's wife, refused to participate in the whole thing. So he did all the preparations himself. Summer was sweltering, so a large table was set up under the trees in the garden next to the pool. There were already some dishes and food on it. Mike, William approached his cook. Will you be able to stay? Cause I'm afraid we're not gonna have much time for kebabs. I'll pay you double, he winked. The cook readily agreed and went on with his work. At 28, the first car showed up outside the gate. William went to meet the guests. 10 people were to come to the party. A few managers from the company a good friend of William's, and, of course, Tim. The latter this time could not resist surprises. His younger brother invited people William didn't know to the bachelor party. Hello? In surprise, he shook hands with the guests. Come on in. I'm so glad to see you. His brother glanced questioningly at Tim, but he pretended that nothing had happened. On the way out, he whispered in his ear that these were important people and should be friends with them. The party was in full swing. Alcohol was flowing. William drank a lot, but only beer. Nevertheless, it caught up with him too. And the birthday boy could barely move his tongue after four bottles because of his lack of drinking experience. William, Tim came up to him. What's in it for you? He knocked against his bottle of beer, a 200 gram glass of vodka. 
let things continue to go the same way, and maybe even better. The guests drank, ate, discussed something cheerfully. William heard the words of Tim, who was praising himself left and right. I begged him so much he told someone. You have no idea how much money I spent on him to get him to sign with us. William smiled. He knew very well that Tim had not been at any of the serious negotiations. Yes, he helped, but only in the office. He never traveled to the partners. First of all, he didn't have as much knowledge as his older brother, and he couldn't negotiate. Tim was a man for whom the word compromise or mutual benefit was unknown. Everything always revolved around his own interests. But William hoped that one day Tim would grow up and realize what his father had told him for so many years. The man remembered his parents and tears came to his cheeks. William left the company, walking over to the pool. More than three years had passed, but he missed both his mother and father very much. First, his mother had died suddenly. The man never realized that his father had been so deeply attached to her. His heart could not bear the loss, and four months later he died in his sleep. Mommy, Daddy, he whispered and wandered down the path to the back of the garden. This cottage was his mother's favorite place. Yes, she had a huge house in the city, and they had planted a garden there too, according to the latest fashion of landscape design but it was here that mother liked to come with her father on the few days she had free from his work. William walked over to one rowan tree and touched it with his hand. He felt warmth, and it seemed to him that his mother was walking near B. The man looked around at the paths, but there was no one on them. I think I've had too much to drink, he said sadly and looked in the direction of the noisy company. I wish I were alone right now. William sat down on a bench, which was hidden from prying eyes. The man sank into his memories. He saw himself as a boy running around here. William had a dog, the most ordinary street dog he had once picked up. But they had been friends for years. Even with Tim, he had never had such a good relationship as he had with this dog. He even felt like he understood him at the time. William smiled. This is where he and I used to race, he said aloud. Poor Barsic. He always drove the cat into the tree, and then he'd scream. But that was only when the cat jumped into my arms. And when they were without me, the best friends like them was impossible to find. They slept in his cuddle bed. William felt someone touch his shoulder. The man flinched in surprise. Are you sitting here alone? Tim asked him cheerfully. Come on, don't break away from the team. We came here for him, and he left us. I was remembering my parents, my brother said sadly. Mom was very fond of our dacha. You can't bring them back, Tim sighed. We have to move on with our lives. Come on, let's go. The guests are waiting for you. The youngest son had never had any special feelings for his parents. Of course, he loved them in his own way. But a few weeks after the funeral, his heart cleared up and he began to live his normal life. The brothers returned to their guests, but William was no longer interested in continuing the party. He looked around tiredly. All he wanted was for it to be over as soon as possible. But the bachelor party was in full swing, and William realized that no one would leave before two or three in the morning. The man sank back into himself. This time he began to remember how Lily had come into his life. Perhaps their meetings could be called an accident. At that time, William had already had a long-lasting relationship, but somehow it did not go further than meeting twice a week. The young man realized that it was necessary to put a point, but whether habit and with Mia met more than three years, or hope that everything can still change, did not let him say that between them, all over, and they should part. Mia turned out to be a tenacious girl. She really did not want to lose William, but the man did not feel much interest in her and therefore began to appoint dates less and less often. The girl struggled for a while, but then also began to realize that she will not hold him. At this point, when William's relationship with Mia was left almost one ash, the man quite by accident stopped by a cafe. To his great surprise, at one table he spotted his brother with two girls. Hi. William approached him. I didn't expect to see you here. How are you? The man said hello to the strangers as well. When Tim was 25, his father couldn't stand it and kicked him out of the house. He bought him an apartment and gave him some money. Tim also took all his stuff with him, and this you could say was a fortune. Naturally, it didn't end there. The youngest son has never wanted to work and almost every month he begs for money from his father. 
For many years, William rarely met Tim because he lived his own life and occasionally came to his parents' house. I'm doing great, I'm on vacation with the girls. This is Natalie and this is Lily. He introduced the strangers. You're welcome to join us. Thanks, but I can't. I'll take my coffee with me and go to work. William replied quickly. Have the good day, it was very nice to meet you. The man's gaze fell on Lily. She was good. The way she looked, it was hard to imagine how she could sit in the same company as Tim. As it turned out later, Tim was dating Natalie, and she had brought her friend to the meeting. The young people said goodbye, and William went on his way. Only a week later, again by chance, he saw a familiar silhouette. The girl was walking fast. Lily. William opened the car window and called out to her. She stopped. Honestly, I was wondering if it was you or not. He approached the woman he knew. I'm sorry. I don't remember you. She answered coldly and looked at him with an absent look. There was sadness on her for... I'm William, Mike's brother. We met at the cafe a while ago. The man smiled. Yes, I remember now. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you at first, she said, embarrassed. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. I'll give you a lift, William offered at once. He touched the girl's elbow and she hesitated a bit and walked towards his car. Tell you where the man took the car. He looked at the passenger. I need to go to the hospital, she answered dryly. I've had a stomach ache for a few days. I know a doctor who works there. Lara, I can help you. If you want, we'll go to a paid clinic. Vlad's making a fuss. No, thank you. She immediately rejected his offer. It's all right, don't worry. Vlad insisted that he wait for Lara, but she asked him to leave. The man realized that the girl was not quite comfortable to communicate because she was in severe pain. Three days later, Vlad called Maxime to find out how Lara was feeling, I don't know. He was surprised. Have you seen her? What happened to her? He asked question after question. His older brother told him about the meeting with the girl and asked him for Lara's phone number. I don't know her at all. He answered right away. It's some friend of Natasha's. I'll ask her. If she gives me her phone number, I'll call you back. A few minutes later, Maxime called him and said that his friend didn't want to give Lara's number because she didn't talk to strangers at all. Vlad was very sorry. He sincerely wanted to see the girl. With Vika, they finally broke up and Lara somehow got into his soul. They met two weeks later. Vlad often drove along the road where he saw Lara. That's what happened that time. He noticed the girl, who slowly found herself without mood. Lara, hello, how glad I am. Vlad ran up to her. The girl turned pale. Hello? She said hesitantly. She wanted to ignore the man, so she stood silently. So how are you doing? Have you recovered? Vlad didn't let her go. Lara, if you're free, let's go to a cafe. I beg you. Valeria hesitated. In her eyes there was fear and confusion and something else that Vlad did not understand at the time. He asked the girl once more, and she agreed. I'm sorry, maybe I look too intrusive, the man blushed. But I liked you right away. If you have a boyfriend, I'll understand. It's just that I had to ask you directly. No, replied Lily in surprise. William saw a sparkle appear in her eyes. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that, he laughed. It was like a stone had been lifted off my shoulders. From that day on, William began dating Lily. Three months later, he introduced her to his parents. Tim was the only one who didn't like his choice. Jesus, William, couldn't you have found someone more interesting? He resented it. Why did Natalie have to come with her friend that day? If I'd known it was going to be like this, I never would have agreed to meet her. Tim, what don't you like about Lily? I was trying to understand my older brother. Yeah, she's modest, not like your coloring books. Yeah, she's boring. He shouted angrily. You want a bright woman, and you fell for her pretty face. That Lily has no brains at all. So don't cross the line. William got up from his chair. Lily's my girlfriend, and you have to respect her. I don't owe you or her anything, shouted Tim at the top of his voice. Do what you want, but I guarantee you that in a couple of years you'll either hang yourself out of boredom or get a divorce. Unfortunately for Tim, Neither of those things happened. William and Lily seemed to be living soul to soul. The man didn't want to stay with his parents after the wedding, so he and Lily moved into their new home. William looked at the clock. It was almost two.
At first he wanted to call a cab after the party and go home, but he had called Lily three hours ago and warned her that he would stay at the cottage. Well, a few people are up. William, thanks for the party. We had a really good time. The bachelor party was a success. The host offered to call a cab for everyone, but the guests didn't agree. Each of them was sure he wasn't that drunk. William watched the men barely coming out of his wicket gate. One nearly fell over. The cook and one girl helper left as early as 12 o'clock. William and Tim were left alone. Well, brother, Tim hugged the birthday boy. Do you want me to stay with you? Keep you company? No, Tim, thanks. I want to be alone. William objected immediately. I'll call you a cab. No way. I waved my arms at myself. I can drive my beauty with my eyes closed, so don't worry about me. I promise you that nothing will happen to me. The older brother was a little worried, but in the end, he agreed. Tim gave him another goodbye hug and started the car. William waved at him. The man went into the yard and locked the gate. The cook and his assistant had partially cleaned everything up before they left, but William didn't want to leave the mess. He cleared everything off the table and tossed the trash into a container. A few bags of bottles also appeared near it. Well, now we can go to sleep. It's a good thing it's Sunday. Lily won't call me until tonight, he thought tiredly as he walked up the steps to the house. William stopped and sat on the porch. The half moon was illuminating enough to light everything around him. It was half past three, which meant another couple hours and nature would be getting ready for pre-dawn. And why don't Lily and I have children? Suddenly he said out loud. How nice it would be to come here and spend weekends here. William remembered the conversation with the doctor. What he had said to him had sounded like a judgment. I'm sorry, but Lily is infertile. He stuck a knife in William's heart. She can't have children. It's either the result of surgery or she had a serious inflammatory process. The husband then decided to have a frank talk with his wife. She was very embarrassed at first. I was raped in high school, Lily said. After that, I had constant problems for years. Oh my God. William hugged her. Lily, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. After that conversation, William tried not to talk about children. His mother had once suggested he take a child from an orphanage, but his son was afraid to even ask Lily about it. Mom, I love her, and I don't care if she can give me a child or not. He answered her then. I didn't marry her for that. Time passed, but deep in his heart, William longed. Sometimes he would watch videos about children on purpose. At those moments, he laughed and cried. The birthday boy had hoped that the party would help him forget about everything, but the beer he drank reminded him of his pain. His mother and father kept coming to mind. The same question sounded in his head, what to do next? So we should go and sleep, he said to himself. It was getting late, William got up from the steps and opened the door to the house. He decided to spend the night in one of the rooms, which was located on the first floor. The man lay down and his wife appeared before his eyes. His heart stabbed. William regretted that he had not gone home, but it was too late. He felt such a strong sense of loneliness that he wanted to scream. After a while, the man fell into a dream. William woke up abruptly. He heard a sound in his sleep. He listened to it. His body was so tired that he didn't want to get up. Who is it? To calm his soul, he said loudly and fell asleep again. A few minutes later, his eyes opened again. It seemed to the man that the door creaked open. William reached for the lamp, but immediately felt a blow to his head. The man lost consciousness. Let's get him up quickly. Someone ordered quietly. We have very little time. It'll be dawn soon. Another man quickly ran over to him and began pulling William off the bed. The unknown men carried the master to the front door. Then, as if by magic, all the lights in the courtyard went out. It became very dark. The strangers carefully carried William to the gate. A click was heard, and the crooks stopped for a few moments. All was quiet, and they carried the man outside and immediately threw him into the car. After a minute it drove off. The driver did not turn on the headlights as the nearest neighbors who lived here permanently were about 30 meters away. No one noticed the guests. The car was speeding towards the forest. It was already getting light when the driver turned towards an old abandoned farm where farm machinery used to stand. Two men quickly ran out and grabbed William. They carried him into the old building where the door had long since been kicked in. Finish him off, 
ordered one bandit in a hoarse voice. Put on gloves so there would be no marks. The other obeyed and began to beat William with all his might. He didn't regain consciousness. I think that's enough. The first one ordered him to stop. I'll call the man in charge and ask him what we should do with him. The man fidgeted and walked toward the car. He dialed someone. There was no answer for a long time. That's it. He's ready. There was a sleepy voice on the phone, someone yawning. Hide him there for now, so no one finds him. I'll tell you what to do next. Silky obeyed and went back into the building. A second man was squatting there. He ordered him to throw on William some old boards and some clothes that were lying around. Everyone, let's hit the road, take off our gloves, clean the gel off our shoes, the driver said. The bandits returned to their apartment. Now they had to wait to see what the chief had to say about the corpse. They slept until almost evening. At 10 o'clock, the phone rang at the Husky. He listened to what he was told for about five minutes. So let's go quickly. We need to pick him up at 12. I'll tell you the rest on the way. He went into the kitchen. At the beginning of one, the bandits pulled up to the abandoned building where they had left William yesterday. Both were a little worried lest he should be found in the meantime. But underneath the old boards, his body still lay the same. Okay, get ready to cover the tracks and fingerprints, the driver pronounced. Now drag him along. William's body was loaded into the trunk. The second bandit thought he was breathing. He wanted to listen, but the husky man contradicted him. His body actually appeared cold. Come on. We don't have time, the driver shouted at him. Are you doubting your hands? No, replied the other one, confused. I made a chop out of him. Well, everybody carry on. Bandits, as the customer ordered them to do. They took William 200 kilometers away from the city. It was a small provincial place. It was dead silent. The streetlights were not lit. We stop here, the driver said and got out of the car. We need to throw him in this dumpster. In about 10 minutes, William was already there. The men quickly jumped into their Land Rover and sped away from the place. The job was done. Now all they had to do was to get the money, get their things out of the apartment, and leave this place for good. Mary, get me some water came from the room. The girl gave up washing dishes and wiped her hands. She drew a glass of water from the three-liter jar that always stood on the table and carried it to her mother. Is it going to rain? Molly said grudgingly. My whole body aches, so don't you want to live? Mary's mother had been in bed for almost a year. She'd had diabetes for a long time. But a few years ago, it had reached a critical stage, and first Molly had had one toe cut off on her left foot and now they were trying to save the foot. Mary looked lovingly at her mother and stroked her head. They had always lived poor. Who was her father? The girl did not know. Her mother had once told her the story of their love. It was nothing special. She fell in love, like many at her age. The boy promised they'd be married soon. As soon as he found out Molly was pregnant, he just disappeared. Her grandparents were long gone. Grandpa died when Mary was five years old. Grandma had been gone a year before her mother had been given the dreaded diagnosis. Perhaps Molly could have been helped if it weren't for the expensive medications. She had been drinking what they could buy for years, but those medications weren't helping much. Mary was 20 years old when her mother was still walking. She worked at the grocery store, but now Molly couldn't be left alone all day, so her daughter got a job as a janitor. It paid very little, of course. And if it hadn't been for the evening job she'd found, she and her mother would hardly have survived. Mary was a sensitive girl. She was very much worried about her mother, and if it were not for her acquaintance with Oliver, the girl would simply go crazy. With the guy they had been dating for six months. Mom, I'm going to be half an hour late today after cleaning, she said. Oliver and I are going out. He wants to walk me home. Mary, just take him out for an hour, she objected. What kind of date is that? Half an hour? But I can't leave you, smiled her daughter. Oliver won't be able to come to visit us today. He will also meet me for a while. The daughter fed her mother and began to dress. In the evening, she was cleaning one production room. The area was large and the pay was low, but Mary had no other opportunities yet. She could not study, although she wanted to very much. The nearest technical school was in a neighboring town and it was impossible to leave her mother. So Mary lived with the usual household problems and affairs, and a dream of how she could save her mother. The workday was over. It was almost eight o'clock when Mary left the factory. 
There was a guy waiting for her at the gatehouse. Hi, he gave her a hug. You're late today. Something wrong? He took the girl's hand and they went home. No, I'm just not in the mood, she said through her tears. Oliver, I really want to help my mom. She's all I have. Of course you do. I stopped her and kissed her. Aren't you and I going to get married? Well, we are. She looked intently into his eyes. But I don't have any other relatives except her. We'll think of something, I promise you, sighed the young man. They were walking and talking about something all the time. Mostly they were making plans. Oliver wanted them to get married in eight months. The guy almost drove her home. He had one more thing he had to do today. A guy he knew asked him to help him with his car. Promised to pay him well. Let me come to your place this weekend and we'll spend the whole day together. He kissed Mary goodbye. Oliver met the girl when she swept the yard. Several times he had walked by. He had a job there. The guy was constantly getting hired wherever he could. Oliver was 25 and was pretty good at plumbing and electrical work. One day he said hello to Mary and then approached her. The guy hurried to the house his friend had asked him to come to. I'm from Alex about the car, he said as a full man came out of the big house. Come on in. I thought you weren't coming on your way, he said. You take a look around and I'll get changed. Oliver looked around. The landlord seemed to be doing well. They'd decided to work for two hours today, and Oliver was going to be there early tomorrow. The boy was smart. He was from a simple family, and he had to learn everything on the fly. Oliver was already leaving the customer's yard. When a girl appeared on the threshold, she scrutinized him. Oliver didn't expect it himself, but it was as if he had been electrocuted. Goodbye. He shouted loud enough for the stranger to hear him. Oliver, I'll be a little late tomorrow, so you'll get an early start. The owner of the car warned him. My daughter will meet you. Her name is Pam. The young man nodded his head and headed home. The girl was quickly out of his mind and he began to think about Mary. Mary tired, walked into the house. Her mother was already waiting for her. She often slept during the day because she had no energy. Mary, how did it go? She asked curiously. Did Oliver meet you? Mom, it was fine. He and I went for a little walk. He's coming to see us this weekend. Her daughter answered and went to the kitchen to prepare dinner. The big problem was that Molly was on a diet. So Mary cooked separately for herself and for her. Not to say that the girl liked sweets or flour a lot, but still she couldn't eat the food that her mother was allowed to eat. Mary felt a lot of support from Oliver. The guy was even willing to live with them after the registration so his wife could take care of her mother. Mary thought she was very lucky in life. Oliver seemed to her a serious and reliable guy, but nevertheless the girl often felt a sense of hopelessness. Sometimes she cried at night because she realized with her mind that Molly would not live long. The mother and daughter talked a little and the girl, having put her to bed, went to bed herself. They had a small two-room apartment, and that saved. Sometimes she wanted to be alone. The girl set her alarm clock for five. In the summertime, the janitors went to work early, despite the negative attitude of most people to such activities. Mary learned a lot of things. Lately, they were forced to do everything and mow the grass and trim bushes and trees, paint, whitewash, and even help laborers to fix playgrounds on their plots. For this, unfortunately, they were not paid extra. But the work had to be done. Mary wanted to try something else after she registered. She was not a shaved to work as a janitor, but she experienced how people did not appreciate other people's labor. They had no desire to live in cleanliness and comfort. People who were constantly throwing cigarette butts out of their windows thought that was the way it should be. And why do they pay janitors? But for some reason, none of those who were outraged wanted to work as a janitor. Mary was also amazed at how easily people threw not only bread, but also other foods that had not spoiled into the trash. Very often the girl watched in horror as unopened boxes of cookies, sticks of sausage, good fruits, vegetables lay in the container. I don't understand why buy it if you won't eat it, she thought. Where do people get so much money to throw away groceries? Mary never brought anything home. She had a few homeless people she knew, so she would put the food away and they would pick it up at nine o'clock. That's how her working days went. Oliver didn't like his girlfriend sweeping the streets either, but there was nothing he could do about it. The next day, after the wiring replacement he'd been ordered, he went to get his car repaired again. Hello. 
The owner's daughter came out to him. Oliver blushed. Pam stood in a short skirt with her hair loose. The boy walked in and with his head down, headed for the garage. There was something he, while the owner was away, wanted to do. Probably half an hour later, Pam showed up there. She brought him a cold lemonade. The girl smiled shyly. Oliver automatically stared at her breasts. His cheeks flushed, and after thanking the girl, he took up the task again. No sooner had the boy calmed down than she came again. Pam offered to help. No, no, it's not a woman's job, he smiled. I'll do it myself. Thank you. There's something I can do to help. She kept her eyes on him. I can see you're having a hard time on your own. Pam stayed. She was always talking funny. Oliver didn't realize he was joining in. What are you guys into? She asked. Besides fixing cars? Do you go out with your family? Honestly, I'm working all the time right now. I'm getting married next year. I'm raising money, he said. I just don't have time for hobbies right now. I see, Pam smiled. I'm busy right now too. My dad's bringing me up to speed. He wants me to take over our stores. We have two of them. He wanted a son his whole life, but I was born. Oh, I can imagine how much nerve it all takes, sighed the young man. Working with people is always difficult. Yeah, that's true. Pam backed him up. Try to find a reliable person. The sellers steal, the customers steal. Before she could finish, her father came into the garage. He was already in his work uniform. He didn't really get under the car, he was more of a supervisor. But in his dirty clothes, that role seemed more important. Oliver left the customer's house with a strange feeling. He couldn't explain it to himself at the time. The owner had taken his phone number from him so he could call if anything happened. That night Oliver finished his work. He got his money. The young man wanted very much to say goodbye to Pam, but she, to his great dismay, did not come out of the house. An interesting girl flashed through his mind, but he immediately realized, what is this nonsense? He shouted to someone and pushed the thoughts away. Mary was looking forward to seeing Oliver this weekend. Sunday was the only day she didn't have to go to work. The girl baked a pie. She glanced at her watch every now and then. Oliver had already called her and said he'd be there in the evening. He had been urgently asked to help. He appeared on the doorstep with a small bouquet and a cake. Oliver, thank you. The girl hugged him. And I baked a cake. I wanted to surprise you. So we'll be surprised. He kissed her and took her hand and went to Molly's room. Hello, Oliver. She was so happy. How are you doing? How's work? Mary's mother missed talking to him. While Oliver was talking to Molly, the girl set the table. She had already fed her mother so that they could sit down in peace themselves. After tea, the young people talked to the woman again. The guest went into the kitchen for a drink of water. Mary took advantage of this moment and approached her mother. Mother, can Oliver have a sleepover tonight? She blushed. We've been going out with him for a long time. Well, the mother was confused. Mary, you're an adult. You're like 21. Thank you. She didn't let her daughter finish her sentence and gave her a hug. I love you very much. Oliver had nothing to do with it. It was Mary's initiative. The guy didn't mind staying with her. Mary, your mother will definitely not swear, especially she should not be nervous, worried the guest. I can leave. Oliver, stay. I don't have enough time to be with you. You're busy all the time and I am too, the girl said shyly. It could be said that after that day Mary no longer considered herself a bride, but a wife. It seemed to her that she and Oliver were already married, when they were to be stamped in their passports no longer mattered. It was a week after the incident when Oliver's phone rang. It was his old customer calling. They had some plumbing problems and he had decided to call him as a handyman. Oliver was approaching a familiar house. He felt uneasy. Pam ran right up to him. Oliver, hi. She greeted him like an old friend. Come on in. Dad told me you were coming. Hello, Pam. The boy was embarrassed. He told me there was something wrong with your shower. Yeah, we almost got flooded. She laughed. I'm depending on you. I've had the water shut off for half a day. The foreman quickly realized what was wrong. He told Pam that he had to go to the store and buy a new faucet. Yeah, sure. I'll pay for everything. It's just that Daddy is at the same store right now and can't make it, she said. I'll drive you. Oliver was confused. He was about to call a cab. Pam ran out. Five minutes later, she was standing in front of him in very short shorts. She was brushing her hair as she walked. 
The young man blushed profusely. He tried once again to refuse and call a cab, but Pam grabbed his arm and led him to her car. Oliver was sweating profusely. He was having trouble breathing, so he opened the window wide. Where do you want us to go? Pam laughed. It didn't seem to bother her that Oliver couldn't get a word out. Yes, to the plumbing center. He barely spoke. He tried not to look at the driver, but he had to turn around because the girl kept asking him questions. Finally, they reached the place. Pam quickly jumped out of her expensive car and walked forward. Oliver couldn't keep his eyes off her shorts, or rather, what they barely covered. The store clerk cheered up. When he saw her, he stared at her breasts with undisguised pleasure, and it looked like he was about to grab her. Well, my cavalier deliberately loudly said, She, say what we need. I don't know what I'm talking about. Oliver came to his senses and finally took his ease off Pam. He walked over to the salesman and selected an item. With sweetie hands, he took the bag and walked back to the girl's car. This time he walked forward so he wouldn't be seduced by her form. It must be said that Pam was not thin. She had an average build, but all her roundness and bulges were so harmonious that one could say she had a perfect figure. Her 65 pounds suited her just fine. I don't like them, the girl said unhappily as they got into the car. For the likes of this salesman, all girls, like the thing, mostly all men, want to possess us. Oliver remained silent. He thought Pam's outrage at coming to the store like this to provoke the guys, and now to accuse them of it seemed unfair to him. I like serious guys. I don't want to trade myself for nothing, she continued. Yeah, I'm 23 and I'm not married yet. But I'd rather wait for my man to show up than marry someone else and then suffer. Serious how? Oliver couldn't take it anymore. He looked Pam in the eye, but his gaze slid back to her breasts. It's when a guy's a real man. He's got his hands where they belong and his head working, she declared. For the rest of the drive, Oliver's only dream was to replace the faucet and block the landlord's number. Pam was putting him in a sense of danger. It was like she was tempting him physically. He could feel it very well. Here we go, said the foreman after he finished the job. Pam, take the job. Oliver, do you think I know anything about this? She laughed and turned on the water. Suddenly, the shower she was holding spurted water. The girl shrieked in surprise. Oliver went to switch the water. He had to press down on Pam, and he felt her body. The girl stared intently into his eyes. Oliver quickly turned away and stepped aside. He gathered his tools and grabbed his bag and headed for the exit. I hope we won't bother you again. She smiled goodbye and handed him the money. May everything work for you. He replied dryly and said goodbye. Oliver didn't want to look back. He took a quick step forward. Pam had been on his mind for days. He could constantly feel the warmth of her body. He was even ashamed of it. With Mary. They talked on the phone every day and met whenever possible, but the guy realized that he didn't feel like seeing her yet. A week passed, and Oliver felt a strong desire to see Pam again, but he needed an excuse to do so. He couldn't just go and see her. Whether it was Pam's desire or not, two days later, when he was walking from an order downtown, someone honked at him. Pam was smiling contentedly in the car. Oliver, hi, get in, she said right away. Are you going to work or home? The guy didn't lie. He answered that he was free. Pam looked at him intently. The girl smiled enigmatically. Let's get some rest then. She laughed and drove forward with great speed. Something inside the young man wanted to object, but he remained silent. Oliver's palms were sweating profusely. Waves of heat came over his body one after another. Pam turned onto some kind of dirt road. He didn't know these places. I'm going to show you a great place, she said. It's incredibly beautiful. Not many people know it. They must have been driving along this road for another half an hour when a body of water appeared ahead. The young man shuddered. Pam stopped the car, got out and began to undress as she went. The girl was left in just her underwear, in which she jumped into the water. The guy instinctively turned away. Oliver, come here. This is the cleanest lake I know. She waved her hand at him. Come on, don't be afraid. It's not really deep here. Oliver wanted to stay on the shore, but Pam quickly jumped out of the lake and started dragging him into the water. All right, 
He answered grudgingly and began to take off his clothes. The water was really clear. Swim after me. There is a small island here, shouted the girl and began to move her arms smoothly. The boy followed her. In a few minutes, Pam was standing. The water was up to her chest. The island was so tiny that they had to press themselves against each other. This was something Oliver was insanely afraid of, but it didn't seem to bother the girl. She took the initiative and kissed him passionately. That day, Olvier came home late. He heard neither Mary's calls nor the customers. It was as if the boy had entered another world. He had never felt such passion in his life. In those moments, he didn't care. A sense of reality began to return to him later. Around 10 o'clock that evening, Pam stopped the car near Olvier's house. She pulled him to her and kissed him in a way that made his blood boil. I'll see you tomorrow. The girl whispered in his ear and left with a mysterious smile. God, what happened to me? As if the guy came to his senses. I'm with her. He realized with horror that he and Pam had been intimate. Oliver shuddered at the thought. But what about Mary? She loves me. And I love her. A chill ran through his body. Oliver went to bed, but now he felt so much pain and guilt that it terrified him. He spent the rest of the night fighting Pam's charms. But when he felt her touch, he didn't care. He wanted her. He only wanted her. And no matter how hard the boy tried to get rid of her image in his head, she kept haunting him. I'll tell Mary everything in the morning, he decided. I won't lie to her. May she not forgive me, but I can't live with this lie. The young man dialed his girlfriend and apologized that he couldn't call her yesterday. Mary, I'm so sorry. It was a very difficult case, he said in a lost voice. Please, let's meet tonight. Tonight. We need to have a serious talk. Of course, Mary agreed. Oliver was just going crazy. He couldn't eat. He had no appetite. The guy kept fiddling with his cell phone. He had this really strong urge to call Pam. She left him her number yesterday. Jesus, what am I doing? He tried to resist. His hand was ready to press delete already. But Oliver dialed it instead. Hi. It was Pam's soft voice. I've been waiting for you, Oliver, my love. I've missed you so much. Pam. I'm sorry, but we have a... I was gonna say it. He stopped. I've missed you too. The moment of truth had been lost. Oliver was sinking into some unknown passion. The young men agreed to meet in two hours. This time they went to a neighboring town where Oliver rented a hotel. The more he touched the girl, the more it seemed to him that he could not live without her anymore. She became everything to him. I love you. He hugged her. Pam, I need you. I can't do this without you. Neither could I without you. She kissed him. We'll never be apart. I'm all yours. After that meeting, Oliver's life changed dramatically. He no longer doubted that Pam was his destiny. He was embarrassed in front of Mary, but the guy felt he didn't want to play anymore. But he didn't have the courage that day or afterward. For nearly two weeks, he avoided Mary until she found him herself. Mary immediately sensed that something was wrong with Oliver. In general, it could be said that the girl had a good intuition. It was just that at first Mary couldn't understand what her negative feeling was related to. It had happened more than once when Oliver hadn't seen her for two weeks. It happened when he had a good order or a lot of work to do. The guy would secretly give Mary money from Molly. Mother was adamantly against it. She stuck to her old principles. Therefore, in her opinion, her daughter had no right to accept such things from him before marriage. There was a lot of work, and Oliver would have been able to collect something in a few years if it hadn't been for his family. The boy's father drank, often didn't work. He also paid for his younger sister's institute, so it turned out that no matter how much you worked, it wasn't enough. Mary understood all that. She never asked the boy for money. But when Molly was prescribed a more expensive medicine, the girl told him about it. Oliver immediately brought her the amount she needed. For almost three weeks, Mary didn't see Oliver. They talked on the phone every other day. The guy told her that he had some serious problems and as soon as he solved them, they would meet right away. Perhaps Mary would have waited longer, but one morning as she was sweeping the yard, she felt dizzy. The girl felt violently nauseous. She didn't think much of it. But when it happened again for three days, Mary wondered. Her intuition told her that it was exactly what she thought it was. Her hunch was confirmed by the test. 
Oh God, not this. Mary was afraid. We're a long way from registering. She hadn't been in the mood lately. Oliver couldn't solve his problems. And now this. Oliver, she dialed the guy. We need to talk. It's very urgent. Please, let's meet. Uh, he hesitated. Mary, let me call you back this afternoon. Maybe I can come over tonight. What's wrong? I don't want to talk about it over the phone, she objected immediately. Please come over. Oliver didn't call back and didn't come. Mary clearly realized something was going on with her fiancé. She tried calling him all evening. The next day, Mary left her mother after work and went to Oliver's house. Hello, Mary. Mary waved to her from the guy's father, who was clearly drunk. And Oliver's at work. He's doing the sidewalk in the park. He answered her question in a slurred voice. The girl walked hopefully towards the bus stop. She was nervous and excited at the same time. Half an hour later, Mary was walking through the park and looking around. In the distance, some laborers appeared. The girl was happy and hurried towards them. Suddenly, Mary looked at a small grove. There stood a young man and kissed passionately. The boy broke away from the girl and raised his head. Oliver. Mary shrieked quietly. God, what is he doing? Who is this? Chaos was going on in her head. At first, Mary wanted to run away, but she knew this story wouldn't be finished without talking. Oliver, can I talk to you? The girl said coldly as she approached the couple. We need to talk. Mary, startled boyfriend, what are you doing here? Anger replaced the surprise on his face. The young man whispered something in Pam's ear and walked over to Mary. She stared at him intently. I thought you had the courage to tell me about this. Waved her hand in the stranger's direction. Come on, no hysterics, he said in anger. What do you want? Tell me. I'm busy. I see what, or rather, who Mary was angry. You know, I'm even glad that my life from a coward like you saved me. You can't live with traitors. Don't insult me here. Oliver was defending himself. If you're not my destiny, what's my fault? Mary, thank you for everything. But it's over between us. What about our child? Suddenly the girl informed him and threw a questioning look at him. What child? He asked her puzzled. What are you talking about? Are you going to deny that you slept over that night? Oliver, I'm pregnant, Mary answered calmly. You can't get pregnant from one time, he kept denying it. Now I wonder who you've been with besides me. You pretended to be a saint. Turns out you've had a whole bunch of them after me. How could you do that? Mary slapped his cheek with her hand. You're the first man I've ever been with. You fool, get out of here. You're lying. I don't want to see you anymore. He shouted at the top of his voice. Pam approached the young people. She was watching from the sidelines. The girl looked down at Mary. Who are you? What do you want with my fiance? She said in an arrogant voice. Do you know what kind of connections my father has? He'll put you in jail for slander. Oliver, how can you be so ugly? Mary asked the boy. Judging by her, you've stooped very low. She's nothing. Mary turned around and walked away. Hey, you, shouted Pam after her. Thank you I didn't get in your hair, you stupid idiot. Mary was caught up in a string of profanities, but she didn't care anymore. She was hurt, of course, but what hurt her even more was the question of how could anyone fake it like that. Mary realized that many people could pretend they were just playing a part. But how could Oliver, being so insignificant, play his nobility, his love, his prudence so well? Mary disappeared into some corner of the park. She gave vent to her feelings and emotions. Now I must decide what to do with the child. She came to her senses at last. I won't say anything to my mother yet. Mary came home and tried her best not to show what had happened. Did you find your Oliver? Molly asked at once what had happened to him. Oh, mom, he's fine. He's just got a really good job for a few months. So I won't be seeing him for a while, answered her daughter. Mary, you understand him. He is trying for you. So that after the registration, you have money to live together. And there, look, you'll get pregnant right away and he will work alone. I understand, her daughter patted her on the head. Everything will be all right, I promise you. Mary had grown up in an instant. Instead of a naive, sensitive girl, she became a grown woman who had to take responsibility for her life. I still have time. I'll take a few weeks to think about it, and then I'll decide whether to have an abortion or not, she told herself. As the week passed, 
Mary became more and more inclined to think that she would like to keep the baby. But how to do that in her situation, she just couldn't figure out. Neither the mother nor she would be working. No one would be helping them. But something inside her told her that the circumstances in her life would change, and as if for the better. Mary realized that as soon as she made a final decision, she would have to tell her mother about everything. There was no other way out. It was an ordinary summer day. The only difference was that Mary went to work very early. It was half past five, and it was just dawning. The sun had not yet fully lit the sky, so it was gray everywhere. I have to work carefully now, the girl said to herself aloud. I won't be in a hurry. No one is chasing me. Let the foreman say whatever he wants. I'll do what's best for me. Mary waved her broom smoothly. The girl kept thinking about her baby. The second week was coming to an end, and she had already made up her mind she would not have an abortion. How are we going to live on? She thought with no job, no money. This was then the biggest pain for Mary. The girl filled her bucket with garbage and wanted to throw it away. Mary walked over to the big container. She saw how the front of it was piled with boxes and the back was empty. The girl began to throw the boxes over the back. Ouch! At the top of her voice she screamed when she saw a human hand. Mary couldn't do anything for a few minutes out of fear. Then she began to quickly remove the boxes. Soon she discovered a man under them. He did not seem to be breathing. Mary touched him with trembling hands. His body was not cold. Mary put one finger on his wrist. She felt a very faint pulse. An ambulance. Urgent, shouted the girl loudly. A man has been thrown into a dumpster here. He is alive, unconscious. Mary, as lost, ran near the container. She didn't know how to help the man. The girl was afraid to pull him out so as not to make it worse. Twenty minutes later, an ambulance showed up. Several people pulled the stranger out and put him on a stretcher. Where are you taking him? In excitement, said the janitorial woman. To our hospital or to the region? To us, coldly answered her paramedic. He has a chance, and we may not take him to the region. The day's work was not going well. Mary kept thinking about the injured man. Tears ran down her cheeks. How hard it is to give a man life, she thought, and how easily it can be taken away. It's just crazy. The doctor told her that the man had been badly beaten. She couldn't understand why anyone would take a man and mutilate him like that. After all, no money, no idea is worth as much as a human life. Mary came home and told what had happened to her today. Molly was absolutely horrified. Mary, what on earth is it? She said with pale lips. To beat a man half to death and throw him in a dumpster. Have people lost their minds? The daughter and her mother had lunch, but Mary wasn't herself. The girl didn't realize what was happening to her until the idea of going to the hospital to see a stranger popped into her head. Can I visit him? Her heart was pounding frantically. His relatives must have already arrived to see him. Mary struggled with herself for almost an hour, but then she decided to leave her mother for a couple of hours and go to the stranger's house. But much to her dismay, nothing had changed. Would he come to his senses? The visitor asked the doctor who was examining the man. We hope so, he sighed. While the police are searching for his relatives, he will stay with us. Then we'll see. Can I sit with him? Unexpectedly, Mary asked. I won't be long. I'm sorry, but I'm worried about him. The doctor agreed that Mary would visit the patient. The girl had told at the beginning how she had found him, so the doctor had no suspicions about her. The girl sat down beside him and looked intently into the stranger's face. It was all purple from the blows. Mary touched his hair lightly. She felt intense compassion for the man. The IV dripped inaudibly. The machine made quiet, lingering sounds. Everything will be all right. You will definitely come to your senses. She touched his arm. You need to survive. If God wanted you to leave, it would have happened by now. He wants you to stay. Mary sat silently in the room for almost half an hour. She didn't want to leave the stranger but her mother was waiting for her at home, and she didn't want to be late for her evening work. How can I help him? The girl thought all the way. I don't have money for medicine. I told the police this morning. All I can do is pray that he comes to his senses. Mary said her request to herself, and it made her feel better. She had to hurry home, so she hurried to the bus stop. Cleaning up at the factory was proving to be hard too. Mary realized that the issue with the child was solved for her after she saved the man's life. 
The girl no longer doubted the correctness of her decision. I will not be able to have an abortion. Even if I don't have enough strength and my child ends up in an orphanage, I will still give birth to him. That way he will have an opportunity. He'll have a life. What could be more precious? Mary pondered, wringing out a rag and throwing it on an old mop. In fact, it must be said that all these difficult stories in her life had somehow helped Mary to grow up very quickly. The taste of betrayal, which was very bitter for her, provoked the girl to search for herself in this life. Oliver had bought into lust and passion, and there was nothing to be done about it. But Mary hadn't betrayed him. She believed in him. Then why should she be so hurt by his betrayal? After thinking the question over several times, Mary concluded that it was not her fault, and that there was nothing wrong with her. Sure, Oliver could say that Pam was more beautiful, more desirable. But was that really the point? Then you could just marry a perfectly shaped rubber doll. And something told Mary that Oliver would have a big problem with her. Appearances only make you forget for a short time. Passion would go away like water seeping into sand. But what would be left behind? Somewhere deep, Mary felt that one day Oliver will return to her, and she will not be able to accept him. The girl had changed a lot but he hadn't. He would also remain that Oliver, who outwardly would play a certain role that in no way corresponded to his inner content. God, where did I get those thoughts in my head? Mary wondered as she walked home. I'd never looked at life that way before. Oliver suited me. And I've always wanted things to be like people. But now I realize I need something different. And I'm going to do everything I can to not only have a healthy baby, but to give it everything it needs. I no longer want to live in such poverty, in which my mother and I have been so many years. And I don't want riches, but I do want a decent life. Mary never realized how powerfully motivating children can be. Accepting that she was going to have a child turned everything in her upside down. I can do this, she ordered herself. I'll figure something out. Mommy and me and the baby won't be left on the street. Late that night, Mary and Molly had a very difficult conversation. Mama, there's something I have to tell you. You won't like it very much, but I don't want to hide anything from you, Mary began. Her mother raised herself on the pillow. She could even feel what it was about, but she did not rush things. Oliver and I are over, she continued coldly. He's found another girl. I've talked to him. I've seen them together. So it's not just speculation. He told me everything. Mary covered her mouth with her mother's hand. How can you say that? He seems like such a serious guy. Mom, there's more to it than that. I'm pregnant. The one night he slept over, we were intimate. She said it, the hardest part. I'm not having an abortion. Molly turned pale. She was silent for a while. Her thoughts swirled in her head like a whirlpool that wanted to pull her down with it. Mary, daughter, I have nothing to say to you. I just feel sorry for you. I'm a burden around your neck, but now you're gonna have a baby. I don't know how we're gonna pull this off. I'll agree to have my leg amputated, then they'll give me a pension," suggested the mother. No, Mary said at once. We can fight for your leg for now. We're not agreeing to an amputation. Mom, help me. She looked at her with begging eyes. Mom, we have to figure something out. I need a job at home or something better so I can work when I'm pregnant. Let's think together about what that could be. Molly thought about it. She didn't have such a broad view of life, so no ideas came into her head. Mom, what if I baked pies? A strange thought came into her head. Your sweet pastry dough is so delicious I can't even say. Mary, where do I sell them? Molly sighed. Do you know how many bakers there are like you? On every corner. Mommy, let's give it a try. She knelt down in front of her mother's couch. I'll organize everything here so you make the dough and I'll bake with it. What about your work? Her mother looked at her doubtfully. What will you do with it? I won't be able to work as a janitor for a long time. I'll try to hold out until October, and I will not give up cleaning. By the way, I can offer them my pies and the tenants of my house. Mary, when are you going to bake them? I couldn't imagine my mother. It takes time. Mother, you make the dough, and I'll do the rest. Mary's eyes lit up with joy. I feel like we're going to make it. Mary was so inspired by her idea that the next day Molly was already working on the dough in the morning. Mary had set up a table next to her bed. The woman was able to walk slowly. 
it was decided to make pies with apples and pecan filling. Mary's neighbor was an old grandfather who owned a cottage, so he had a real hazel tree there. He used to bring Molly a bag of them all the time. They already had so many walnuts they had nowhere to put them. Mary finished sweeping and rushed home where her mother had already made pies. Her daughter baked them. It was almost four when Mary began shopping and offering her goods. To her surprise, one store took ten pies. Of course, the price was small, but still. Mom, I'm going to the hospital quickly and then to the factory. I'll offer Mary the rest of the baked goods at work. They like to drink tea. Mary sat again for more than half an hour with the stranger. This time she kept telling him something. Imagine it occurred to me that my mother and I could bake cakes and earn a little money from them. She stroked the man's arm. Do you think that would work? The man was silent because he was still unconscious as well. I'm also definitely keeping my baby. You can say it's unreasonable, but I'll give him life and I promise you I'll never leave him. Mary gave the stranger's doctor some cakes and asked it how he was doing. I think he will recover soon. I can see considerable improvement. As for relatives, no one has shown up yet. Either Mary really was powerfully motivated, or it really was her way, but all her pies at the factory were immediately snapped up. We made it, Mom, shouted Mary in the hallway when she got home. Molly was happy for her daughter. She realized she should be making an effort, too. Mary pulled out their first money they'd made from baking today. Suddenly her phone rang. Yes, all right. Then at the same time a girl spoke to someone. Can you take twenty at once? Yes, we can. Mary was dancing with joy. The owner of the store where she took the baked goods today. She ordered more. Anyone could have said that it was crazy and that it was impossible to make anything on pies, that it was too great a waste of time and gas. But Mary stood her ground. Mary was exhausted but the result gave her strength. It had been almost a week now, and her little business was gaining momentum. Molly had cheered up too. She got up more often. She had energy. She continued to go to the stranger's house every day and talk to him. He became both a friend and an outlet for her, probably precisely because he seemed to her to just listen to her. As soon as you come to your senses, I'll treat you to some of my pies. Mary spoke, stroking the man's hair. I'm sure you'll like them. It's my mother's signature recipe, which she inherited from her great-grandmother. I wish you'd come back soon. There were tears in her eyes. The doctor said it would be soon. The next day morning the foreman of the site gave Mary a scandal. Another handyman had quit, and he ordered her to remove two withered spruce trees. Not only were the trees big, but they had to be sawed into pieces to be thrown in the dumpster. Are you crazy? Mary argued with him. Not every man can do it. I'm not going to do it. You know, I don't care what you do. If you don't want to work, quit, he shouted angrily at the employee. All right, then I quit. She wouldn't give up. You've got to have a conscience. They pay us pennies, but they want us to work for three. The foreman cursed profanely, and Mary carried the baby carriage with the bucket and the broom to her basement. It was over for her. All the janitors endured constant bullying. Sometimes they had to work all day because they did the work instead of laborers. Everyone had the illusion that a janitor only works a few hours a day. His working day was seven hours and only one day off, but in total they were accruing pennies. In terms of hours, they had a regular schedule from eight to five with two days off, but no one paid them that kind of money. Sometimes their paychecks were even late. Mary came home angry. She realized that the issue wasn't even about the foreman. The bosses didn't care as long as they got what they needed done. Mom, I quit. It's cold, her daughter said when she came in. That's it. There's no more strength. They made me cut down the Christmas trees and then throw them in the dumpster. Mary, maybe it's for the best. There's optimism in her eyes. As long as you're doing the pee thing and they're taking it from you, maybe it's not worth the cleanup. The next day she left early and went straight to the hospital. The doctor stopped her. He's awake. He told her cheerfully. So everything will be all right now. Had his relatives arrived? The guest was a little frightened. Does he remember them? The police had already come. She knows who he is, answered the doctor. But his wife hasn't arrived yet. Mary's heart ached. She wanted to leave, but something stopped her. Hello, she said shyly. How are you feeling? Mary stood against the wall. Good afternoon. The stranger tried to smile. I think it was you who came to see me. I heard your voice. Yes. Mary was frightened, 
and remembered all the things she had said to him. I thought you said you were going to bring me your pies. I wouldn't say no. He barely spoke. The girl took out the package and put it on the nightstand. Mary realized he needed help. She took out one apple pie and helped her guest take a bite. He chewed slowly. Delicious, he said with his mouth full. My name is William, and I believe your name is Mary. You told me. Uh-huh, she mumbled to herself. I'm very glad you're back. Really embarrassed. Mary, I know you're probably busy, but I'd really like to see you again. I just don't have much energy to talk to you yet, William asked her. So he had heard everything, worried the girl as she hurried home. I didn't say anything to him. His name is William. That's a nice name. Okay, stop. The doctor said he had a wife. Mary's happiness immediately turned to intense pain. Nevertheless, the next day after lunch, she went to see William. The girl brought him a home-cooked meal. She fed the man. It was still hard for him to do it on his own. Suddenly the door opened and a beautiful woman and a man in his thirties entered the room. William ran up to the man. The guest, how did you frighten us? Brother, what's wrong? We've been looking all over for you. Hello, Lily. He squeezed Tim's hand lightly and looked at his wife. She smiled oddly. Maybe William had gotten used to both his wife and Tim over the years, but after not seeing them for a while their behavior seemed unusual to him. Mary stepped aside and watched the scene. She looked at the strangers with fresh eyes and questions kept coming up in her mind. We didn't rush out to look for you until two days later. You told Lily not to bother you, didn't you? And I called her afterwards and warned her that you'd be sleeping at the cottage for a few days. We never thought anything could have happened to you. What did the police say? William sighed. Do they have any theory yet? I don't remember anything. Maybe you saw or heard who did it? Tim asked. Did you regain consciousness for a while? William shook his head in the negative. He kept glancing at his wife, but she, to his surprise, kept a little cold. Jesus, we thought we'd lost you. Lily's been going crazy this whole time. Threw Tim his gaze at the woman. The first few days of stress she couldn't even speak. It seemed to Mary that William's wife was very nervous. She tugged at the handles of her bag now and then. Well, I've already made arrangements with the doctors, so let's go home. I heard Tim's voice, who was practically talking to himself. Lily, how are you? William took his wife's hand, but she pulled away from him. Her fingers were as cold as she was. I'm fine, she answered quietly. William, I'm sorry. I've been through so much in this time, she said in an apologetic tone. I'm going to lie here for now, at least until the police are on the trail of the criminals, said the older brother. Tim, I'm not going anywhere. William. Well, you can't be serious. He objected immediately. We've worked so hard to find you. I'm being hunted and these people think I'm dead. Let's keep it that way for now, he said gravely. Print me a document appointing someone to take over my duties. Make it Jack. Jack? Tim turned pale. William, I'm better at this than he is. Tim, do as I say, big brother. Let things go on as they are for the time being. The guest's mood immediately soured. He shut up and stared out the window. Mary noticed the way Lily kept looking at him. There was a look of concern in her eyes. All right. We'll come by tomorrow morning, Tim said, and took his hands out of his pockets. I'll bring you everything. Mary slipped out of the room unnoticed. It all seemed strange to her. From the conversations, the girl realized that William was a wealthy man who had a large company. She also learned that he had a younger brother, and apparently, William did not trust him in something. And most importantly, the victim's wife showed no signs of sympathy or concern for her husband. The girl intuitively lingered. She saw William's visitors leaving the hospital. Mary was wary. Team held Lily by the waist. But the strangest thing was that before she got into the car, he kissed her. Lily, really? Tim tried to calm her down. We'll figure something out. Tim, I can't take it anymore, she said through her tears. When will it be over? The car started and Tim drove to the hotel where he and Lily were to spend the night. Years ago, long before she met William, Lily had met Tim. She was 19 then, and he was 28. She had fallen madly in love with him then. Tim had a way of courting that was second to none. Lily immediately realized that Tim was popular with the girls, and he wouldn't stop at one. Lily, you fool, I love only you, 
he said to her in a fit of passion. I don't care about any other girl after you. Was Lily also calculating? Of course, Tim had always advertised himself as an eligible suitor. He had a nice apartment. He didn't work anywhere. But Tim always had money. Lily, well aware of her looks, realized that she deserved more than just marrying an ordinary guy. A year she lived at his place ended the honeymoon period, and the lovers began to quarrel constantly. Who were you with? screamed the girl. You reek of women's perfume. You bastard. I'm leaving you. For a while, Tim managed to calm her down somehow. Lily was crazy about him, and he could use that. And he felt like he loved her. Of course, that didn't stop him from seeing other girls. Almost three years passed in a constant battle of attitudes. Well, if you love me, then marry me, a girl yelled at him. You horny asshole. You're not capable of love at all. I'll marry you, he yelled back. But not now. Lily, just wait a little while. In a couple of years I'll get my money and we'll have a fancy wedding. Then Lily left him. They didn't speak for almost a year. And the girl lived her life. Or rather, she suffered in silence. She could not without her Tim, but it was beyond her dignity to run after him. Tim waited for her to come back to him on her own. But it didn't work out the way he wanted. Then the man had to admit that he needed Lily. He couldn't do it without her. So began the second stage of their relationship, and everything went according to the same scenario. They were happy for a year. They started planning a family, but Tim couldn't take it anymore. He needed other connections, and he again found girls on the side. Two years later, Lily got pregnant for the first time. She hoped that now her Tim would settle down and they would finally start a normal life. But no, it didn't work out. The girl had an abortion to spite him. Are you crazy? Tim yelled at her. It was our baby. What did you do? If you wanted it, you wouldn't be climbing in other people's beds, she said angrily. Tim, I'm leaving. Lily. He was on his knees in front of her. I swear I only love you. I have no one else but you. The girl wanted to believe it, so she gave her lover one more chance. Then they stayed together for another year and a half. Lily left. Tim suffered a lot at first, but then he admitted to himself that no matter how much he loved Lily, he could not sacrifice himself for her. The man kept convincing himself that he needed variety. Lily tried other relationships but quickly realized that the only man she could have one with was Tim. She saw only two choices either go back to him and let him do whatever he wanted or forget him. Lily took the second path. She felt like she was trying really hard. But one spring day Tim rang her doorbell. She couldn't stand it and threw herself on his neck. The young people began to live together again. But that period did not last long. Lily during the breakup has already realized something about herself so she no longer had such illusions. Almost a few months later they began to fight again. Because of Tim's wild lifestyle. When William saw them in the cafe, it was Lily's date with Tim, because she had left him again. But in the midst of their conversation, an acquaintance of his approached them. Lily didn't give him a scandal, but it was clear to her that it was one of his past passions. Why had Lily agreed to meet him then? because she had a very important reason. She wanted to tell Tim that she was pregnant, but they never got to that point that day. Lily was rushing to the hospital for an abortion when William met her. She was so very angry with Tim then. She really wanted to get back at him for all the pain he had caused her. So the girl decided to start a relationship with his older brother. When Tim found out that William was going to marry her, he gave her a huge scandal. I'm going to tell him about our relationship, he shouted, coming to her house. You can't do that. You love me. Tim, your time is up. She replied calmly. I've waited too long for you. I'm going to marry William. But after the wedding, her pain slowly began to subside, and Lily realized that she had made a mistake. Her heart began to pound frantically at the sight of Tim. Her whole being was drawn to him. It didn't take long for their new romance to take off. Naturally, they met in secret. William knew nothing about it and had no idea. Lily couldn't have children because of abortion, so she didn't risk anything. Tim, I want to live with you all the time, she told the man. I don't love William. He, on the other hand, had tried to swing his rights to get half of his father's property, but he was having no luck. Lily, wait a bit. I'll finish my business soon. Then we'll take our money and get out of here, Tim promised. But soon his mother died, and then his father. And they were left in limbo. Tim had almost nothing left in his mind. 
and he wanted revenge on his brother. He took away all my money, my possessions, and the woman I love. Tim grieved. I won't let it go. It took almost two years to develop their plan. Tim had gained the trust of his older brother. At least he now worked with him in the office. The main operation was planned for William's birthday, or rather a bachelor party that Tim had designed. He had brought his guests to the party with him, who had carefully placed cameras and discovered where the power switch from the entire house was located. Tim kept an eye on his brother all evening, but the rest was a work in progress. The same specially hired men watched from a car that was parked not far from the house. They knew when William had gone to bed. After Tim left the cottage, he went straight to Leal's house. While whipping William, they spent an unforgettable night. Tim, how do we get rid of him now? Lily cried when they got to the hotel. He didn't want to go to our hospital and we've already agreed that they'll kill him there. We'll go the other way. Tim sighed and pulled her to him. Let him come to his senses and recover, and then we'll decide everything. Let's just forget about it. We've put so much effort into this. After this incident, he'll be very careful. She kissed him. I love you so much, Tim. I really want us to be together. We will be. You're mine. He kept his eyes on her. Lily. William will be out of our lives, I promise you that. Mary stood frozen. She didn't know what to do. The girl slowly wandered into the hospital. She saw William thinking about something. Uh, Mary? He was happy. Where have you been? I've been wanting to talk to you. Have you seen my brother and my wife? Yes, she answered quietly. William, I'm sorry, it's none of my business. But she stopped. But he was kissing her. Tim Lilly? In horror, he interjected. Did you see that? Mary, don't be silent. Tell me. Yes. I left a little before they did. I was standing outside the hospital when they came out. Before he got in the car, he kissed her. She answered in a shaky voice. So my premonition was justified. Tears showed in his eyes. Mary, help me, please. He looked at her pleadingly. What do you want? Mary was frightened. Please give me your cell phone. I can't call from the one my brother left me. It's probably bugged. William talked on the phone for about ten minutes. He didn't want anyone to know his location, but now the shadow was falling on his brother and his wife. Mary, please buy me something. I need a cell phone and a bug. I'll do the rest later, William asked her. Okay, she agreed. Only I don't know what exactly you need. The girl was embarrassed. William explained to her what she needed to bring, and twenty minutes later, Mary was already in the electronics store. Her mother had already called her several times and the girl was very nervous. She ran to the hospital and handed William what he had asked for. Tim had brought him enough money so he was free to act now. Mary, I'll pay you well. Please come tomorrow for the whole day, or rather until my brother arrives. Perhaps from ten to two o'clock he won't get up any earlier. Give me a hand. They won't leave me alone. I need you to put a bug on either my wife's bag or my brother's briefcase. I know it's dangerous but I'll distract them. Otherwise, I'm definitely going to the other side of the world soon, the man asked her. Mary was very afraid, but she agreed to help William. And she was on time, too. She had to take the pies to the store at nine. Then she would be free. Then her mother would deliver the next batch, and she would be done with them by six o'clock. She could get to the factory at half past seven, where the working day ended at seven. Mary said goodbye to William. She had a feeling that she was in trouble. The girl remembered how she had found the man in the container, and her heart shuddered. Is he really ready to kill his brother? She thought. Before her eyes lay an almost dead man, Mary felt the intense pain again. How could one so easily dispose of other people's fates? The girl arrived home and immediately got to work. Her mother was already waiting for her. For the first time, Molly herself lit the stove and put the first batch of pies. Mary had an impressive order of almost thirty. There were a lot of people working at the factory. Word of her baking spread quickly. That day, Mary came home exhausted. Getting up every day at four in the morning to put the dough was not easy, and the pregnancy was making itself felt. At times, she felt very nauseous. Mom, if it goes on like this, then I'll quit the factory. I'll only bring pies there, Mary said that day. The girl decided not to tell her mother about William yet. She gave her general information how he was feeling and what the doctors said. 
Today William gave her money, though she didn't want to take it. Her daughter didn't want to talk about them yet either. It was hard for her to explain how she could have gotten 15000 Mary, you're expecting a baby, William insisted. And your mother is sick. Please let me thank you for everything. That night the girl did not sleep well. She felt that her ward was a kind man. Despite his wealth he spoke to her as an equal. And she liked William in general. I wish my husband were like him, she whispered. William was manly and clever for the first time Mary saw the difference between Oliver and her new acquaintance. They seemed like heaven and earth to her, and it wasn't about money at all. William had been through such a difficult ordeal and survived. There was never a single complaint in his words. He just wanted to know who had done this to him. He didn't say how poor and miserable he was or that he was unlucky. But at the same time, he didn't play the cold-blooded and unfeeling man. You know, when I was lying there and I realized that my brain was working, but I couldn't control my body. I could hear everything that was going on around me. I had intense panic and fear, William once told her. It's the scariest experience I've ever had. Death is not so scary. It's scary to be stuck when you're not there and you're not here. The next day without 2010, Mary was already by William's side. He looked at her happily and told her about his four-legged friend he had as a child. And I love cats, Mary said. Only we didn't have the opportunity to keep them. But I'd love to have a kitty in my house. And it would be good for the baby. Mary, what does his father say? William asked cautiously. I don't know what it's like to have a child, though I've wanted one all my life. He doesn't need one. The girl lowered her eyes. So he will grow up without a father. Suddenly voices were heard and Tim entered the room with Lily. William looked at Mary carefully. She realized that she needed to act. William kept saying something. He glanced at the girl, and she moved closer. The man asked Lily and Tim to read the contract carefully. There was something he didn't like. Mary finally managed to snag a bug on the side of Lily's bag. It was invisible. The girl immediately bounced away from the guests. She was pretty scared. Okay, all right. I must have imagined it. Mary heard William's voice. So be it. He signed the document. The guests didn't stay long. His brother had warned William that they would come to see him on the weekend. Mary stood like a shadow, watching them. As soon as the door slammed shut, William immediately turned on his phone. He heard footsteps, someone coming down the stairs, then the door creaked open. Apparently they had gone outside. Tim swore profanely at his older brother. As soon as the car door slammed shut, William no longer had any doubt that they had prepared the assassination attempt on him. Mary noticed tears dripping from the man's eyes. She understood his pain, and she too had been betrayed. And it was impossible to forget it so quickly. The girl didn't want to disturb William. She saw him sink into himself. Mary left the hospital and drove home. There was uneasiness in her heart. She felt sorry for William. She wanted to help him. But right now he needed time. It so happened that the next day Mary could not come to the hospital. She was very nauseous. The girl only managed to take the order to the store and almost until the evening lay in bed. Yes, and she got to the factory with difficulty. Last night it was taken away. The next day heard Mary as the verdict. William was not in the ward. But who was? In hesitation, she asked. He couldn't walk yet, after all. Some people had come for him, some acquaintances. Anyway, the police and the doctors were here, the doctor said tiredly. Mary reluctantly returned home. William had become very dear to her during this time. He had left her his new phone number. With trembling hands, Mary dialed it. But it was blocked. That was it. The girl cried. I guess it's time for us to part. He's a good man. May everything work out for him. Two months passed. Mary and her mother were still baking pies. A lot of people loved their baking, so it was a busy time. If it wasn't for Mary's pregnancy, she'd be taking more orders. They even began to think about buying a used oven. The girl often thought of William. She decided that if she had a son, she would name him after him. Mary, the doorbell. Molly distracted the girl from her thoughts. Go and see. On the landing stood William with a huge bouquet of flowers. Next to him were several other men. Mary noticed at once that he was leaning on one crutch. Well, I found you. The guest rejoiced. Mary, can you imagine... Someone stole that cell phone from me at the hospital? 
It's a good thing I had time to send the recordings to a policeman I knew that day. I couldn't warn you. I had an urgent case to take care of. I'm sorry about what happened. William, she threw herself on his neck and cried. I've been waiting for you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mary, I love you. I've had plenty of time to realize that. He stroked her hair. Everything's gonna be all right now. My brother and my wife went to jail. It's been six months. There was always a man outside Mary's door. He kept ringing the doorbell. Who do you want? A disgruntled neighbor came out. You've been hanging around here all day. What do you want? I'm here to see Mary, said the young man. I've been calling all day, but she's not home. That's right. She doesn't live here anymore. The woman said in Greeley. She got married about five months ago and move it away. Her rich fiancé took her mother with him. Mary got married? Oliver was stunned. But she did. Where does she live now? I don't know. The neighbor shrugged. They drove them out in expensive cars. They say her husband cured her mother. At least she's walking now. And I heard they're having a son soon. Oliver lowered his head. He had been hesitant to go to Mary for almost two months. But hope overcame him, and, overcome either by pride or guilt, he went to her quickly. Very quickly his affair with Pam came to an end. Three months of unbridled passion, and then it came to an abrupt end. Pam, but if you and I are going to get married maybe you shouldn't dress like that. Her boyfriend asked her with jealousy in his voice. Your skirt barely covers your underwear. Oliver, what are you doing? She laughed. I'm a pretty girl, and I need a man's attention. And besides, I'm not sleeping with them. I'm sleeping with you. But that's not enough. He got angry. But you still need to be more discreet. Oliver, why are you being so boring? Pam threw angrily and began to paint her lips bright red. You and I are going out in public, and everyone's going to be looking at me. Oliver began to visit Pam's house often, and to his surprise her father didn't mind. The girl finished her makeup and they got into the car. Pam kissed him passionately. The more the young people walked around the market town, the more Oliver realized that for Pam it was as if he was absent. She cast flirtatious glances at the young men and guys. After that trip, the guy had given her a scandal. Well, you know, you're either going to have to accept that I'm like this or you're not going to get it. Which one? A horny broad? He couldn't take it anymore. Pam, you're acting like you're putting yourself on the market. I'm not your wife yet, so don't get hysterical with me, she said, closing the car door and driving away. Oliver felt as if he'd been caught in freezing rain. He clearly realized that his relationship with Pam had been a mistake. She'd never loved him. She wanted attention, adoration, passion. But she wasn't capable of love. This is how we destroy our destinies, Oliver said out loud. I had everything, but I gave it up for lust. I suffered for it. Tears poured from his eyes, but he didn't feel them. Mary would never be in his life again, and neither would their child.